you know, we've been through this whole, like, the Feast of Tabernacles. We were in it, and I don't know if any of you saw the video I posted. I think it was last week sometime, um, or week before now. But the, the Lord is speaking a lot about water, and so I was like, okay, here we are. Today, actually, t- today at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. starts the last day of Sukkot. And uh, so the Feast of Tabernacles, we got, we got one more day. If you didn't get your joy in this week, if you just really didn't rock the joy, it's, you get one, one last chance today. The six to six tomorrow. And it's the, it is the, the place that Danny preached out of last week where Jesus uh, says on the final and great day of the feast that Jesus got up and said, Hey, anybody thirsty? <laughs> and he, he prophesied about who he was. And he was prophesying as much to us as he was to that group of people gathered. He's still saying it. Because in, that ver- in the way he spoke it, it doesn't say, if any of you shall come and take a sip from me. He says, If any of you keep coming to me and keep on drinking from me and keep on believing in me, if you'll keep coming and you'll keep drinking and you'll keep believing, he said, I declare to you, there'll be rivers flowing out of you. Because this is the paradoxical river of God. This is the river that quenches your thirst and creates it. And so there's no place to stay but in the river if you're thirsty and you need quenching, but you also need to be thirsty. And so this is the beautiful place. And I was like, Lord, I don't know how, I want to preach about the river. I want to preach about the river. And he said, go, go back over to Proverbs 31. I got to show you something. And I said, okay. So this is what, this is what the Lord gave me for this week. If you look at, if you're looking with me, it's Proverbs 31, 17. <clears throat> and in the Naz, it, um, it reads like this. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Now, this woman I see uh, she, to me, is a picture of where we're headed. She is a picture of the end time church of Jesus Christ, a force to be reckoned with. She's called an excellent wife, but the word excellent means mighty man of valor. It's the exact same word. So those men that were described as David's mighty men, the heroes of the days of David, same word that this woman is being described as. She is a force to be reckoned with. And I mean that in the best way possible. (laughs) She is a woman of wealth. She is a woman of wisdom. She has her husband's heart and she has his back. And he has confidence in her. She is diligent. She knows how to acquire whatever is needed by her household and those living around her. She knows how to find new supply lines. And this, our, the church, River City and the church of Jesus at this moment is going to have to know how to open new supply lines during this season. We may have to go places we've never been in the spirit and open up and walk through places or portals that we, have, we didn't even know they were there. Scriptures, both old and new, will come alive to us. Things that we've never seen, but by the illumination lamp of the spirit of God, we will know how to do what we are being called to do in this season. I just believe that. Thank you for amen in that. She has the ability, and I preached this last month, she has the ability to rise and shine until the glory comes. Even in a dark place, she knows how to keep her lamp lit. Now, I used to think that this meant that she never got any sleep. 
But the same Solomon that wrote this wrote um, in another place that it is, it's not wise to stay up all the time. It, sleep is good. God sometimes waits for you to go to sleep so that he can give to his beloved in sleep. I don't know if Solomon wrote that or if it was David, his daddy, but principle's the same. This is not about, th- this is about learning how to move while you're awake and, and create the light. Get up and shine until we are absolutely um, completely being fulfilled as the body of Christ in a new way because of the glory of God. We keep crying out for the glory, for the river, for, for the, the words of the Lord. He prophesied himself. He said, one day, i am tell you something. He said, when all those 10 spies came against the two, because they didn't like how they interpreted the report. And he said, I'll tell you, I'm going to excuse this right now, but one day the earth will be filled with my glory. And he's not backing off of that, right? And I want to challenge us to believe and go back and read the scriptures. Um, Can I just open up a door just long enough to stir up a hornet's nest? You know, all this, many times in the scripture, especially in the New Testament, it talks about the apocalypto of Jesus, the pull back, like somebody's pulling back a curtain, the apocalypto of Jesus. And many times, commentators from the past and preachers and teachers have used that phrase. It, 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 they'll even say the appearing of Jesus. And we always go in our head, we make this click, click, and we check out because we think the appearing of Jesus, we always think it means when he splits the sky and comes in the clouds and comes to yank us out of here. But there is another appearing that the word talks about, and it's in Romans 8. And it said, all creation is groaning for the sons and the daughters to finally take their place. The appearing of Jesus through the body of Christ. So, I don't know. Maybe that's just a little bit of a shake and wake, you know. Shake and wake call. Maybe, maybe we need to change some of the pictures in our heads. Jesus is coming back. He is going to split the sky. But he's not coming back for no broke down bride. She's going to be glorious. This is the way he does things, you know. It's just the, his, his, it's his MO. It's his thumbprint. <laughs> he, he's coming for a, a goodly woman. And so... Um, This woman, we see in verse 17, that she, everything about her exudes strength. She's strong. Um, I, I meant to bring a, I meant to bring a belt, but I can't, so I'll use this. This is what it means to gird yourself up. She, and in, in, maybe in the King James, it might even say she girds her loins. I can't remember. This is what it means. It's what Jesus did when he was about to wash their feet. So she's, she's getting ready for action. She's girding herself up. Now, you can gird yourself with a garment, and you can gird yourself um, uh, that, with, uh, with lots of things. You'll see that word in Scripture over and over about gir- girding yourself. It's uh, not only in the Old Testament, but it's in the New Testament. But she's... She's girding herself with strength, and she makes her arms strong as well. Gird means to put on a belt and get ready to go. It's first mentioned in Exodus when Moses told the people, gird yourselves, put sandals on your feet, get your staff in your hand, and eat this Passover meal and uh, and get ready because we fixing to get out of here. Gird yourself. Get ready. 
Luke reports this story that Jesus told us, and he said, I need for you to gird yourselves. In other words, that gets translated, dress yourselves in readiness. I used to come to church in prissy clothes way back in the day before the Lord had me move so much during worship. If you stand standing right still, you can dress in prissy dresses. You dress for what is coming. Hey, hey. You dress for what you're getting ready to do. You dress appropriately for the action that is coming. And he said, dress in readiness. Keep your lamp lit. Be like those waiting to hear the master's knock at the door so that you can immediately open the door. And then he says something crazy radical. Jesus said, if I come in the door and you have girded yourself up and your lamps are lit, I'm going to gird myself up and sit you down at my table and I'm going to feed you. Now that's radical, radical, but we know he knows how to do it because he did it to those guys in the upper room before he left planet. He said, I'm showing you something now. I'm showing you. He, he was entering into covenant with them. There's a, and like, he wasn't just washing their feet because they had dirty feet. Peter said, Dude, if, you, if it's because I'm dirty, then wash me head to toe. He said, I don't need to wash you head to toe. But I need for you to understand what I'm doing to you. Is, this is life to you. This water that I'm putting on you. I, this is life. And I need you to understand this. So um, you can also gird on weapons. Every person in the Bible who's gone to war says they girded on weapons. Even the ones that they were hiding in their clothes. They girded them on. So to be girded means that you're dressed, ready for action in appropriate sense. That you're dressed in clothes that you need. That you need at this moment. And that you are fully armed. You're fully armed. So this woman is girding herself with strength. And this word in Hebrew is oz. Oz. She's girding herself with strength. And it means might, boldness, a force to be reckoned with, security. It also means oz means majesty. She's girding herself with his majesty, his praise, and his power. In the word of God, this word strength, O's, is an essential attribute both in the old covenant and the new. Talks a lot about O's, strength, God's strength. What does it mean to be strong? Strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Strong, strong. It's used to describe not only people, and first of all, the Lord, but any type of stronghold, any place where God has given you the battle advantage. And uh, we're, we're gonna have to be savvy in the days to come to know uh, where, where the battles are. So we're not over here, right, fight, trying to fight something that God is not, not say he's not called us to that place. So we have to ask God to give us, show us where the battle advantage is. Now, one of the things that blesses my socks off, and as y'all saw the children down here worshiping this morning, if you, if you saw them, um, one of the things that blesses my socks off is that God has already told us one place that he's given us battle advantage. He spells it out in the word of God really well. It's both in Psalm 8 and then Jesus repeats it out of his own mouth when the children are praising when he comes in the city. And Jesus said, do you not know the word of God that says that if you shut that that if you shut their mouths, the rocks will begin to break open. 
He had cracked this place all to pieces. You want them to worship because God has established himself and owes in the mouths of babies and children. And why do we think the enemy is hard at it trying to kill the children of this generation in the last, for the last 50 years in a legal way in this country? Because he knows about the O's in the children's mouths. I've said it before. Um, I really feel like, you know, we always think that we're here because we're here for the children, and we are. We're supposed to be guardians of the children. But in a very real way, spiritually, children have been sent here for us. They open their mouths and they do warfare. God, it says God built a bulwark, a, a place, a stronghold in them that, it, 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 this is crazy. It's crazy to think about that. Of course, it will change how you see when your baby starts crying because you're like, oh, Lord Jesus. I was trying to get him to be quiet, but crank it up, baby. Crank it up, right? That babbling, we do not understand it. We don't understand it. And it's still power. It's pure power. Pure power. Uh, twice, just in the last few days, um, somebody has either sent or told me about their child prophesying. Uh, one, one of those times, I think, um, was Dana and Mav in the car. And Mav said, I hear rain. Dana said it wasn't raining. And then she realized what he was saying because she could hear the sound. And she's like, it is rain. Rain is coming. And this, a child saying this. And then this morning, Jessa said that on the way here, um, Ez said, I see two mountains. He's never seen real mountains in his whole life. He's never been to the mountains. And then he got here, and I didn't even know he'd said this. And I said, Ez, look at the picture while we're worshiping. It's mountains. And he did his eyes. I, I wondered what he was thinking because his eyes got so big. It was like he had seen those mountains in the car. So we began to, we were worshiping about mountains and God's ability to move mountains. Children bring it in the spirit. And we got to start really listening to what they say. I mean, they might say some crazy stuff too, but you know, that's no different than any adult I know. <laughs> Saying some crazy stuff. <laughs> it says in Psalm 8 that God did this because of his adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. In other words, he put, he put strength in a child's babble. Isn't that just like God? Take something that you think, well, there's just, what is that even about? That's nothing. That's a nothing or less than a nothing. Or we reduce it down to something like scientific. This is because we are all born with the same language and we have to chomsky it out and learn that we have to make these syllables if we're from this, right? You know, okay, yeah, okay, okay. What God intended was that a baby's babbling could tear down strongholds in the spirit. Woo, woo, it's warfare. That same word, O's, can mean an instrument of praise. In, just so even what was going on up here today, these things with strings and sounds and cymbals and all the instruments of praise are instruments of strength. They are strongholds in the spirit. That's why David could go in and play for Saul and the demonic had to leave. That was under a different covenant. Think of the power of worship and what it does to the atmosphere. And it really, honestly, you know, your voice is the best instrument on the planet and I don't care if you can carry a tune, if you just sing, this little light of mine, <laughs> right? So uh, the beauty of this word, the message of strength is very important. Isaiah 51 says, awake, awake, 
put on strength arm of the Lord. And if you just go down just a few verses in Isaiah 52, it says, Zion, bride of the Lord, awake, awake, and clothe yourself in strength in your beautiful garments. So the word, the word is riddled with this thing about, uh, about strength and where strength comes from. In Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the seven churches, and there's one called Sardis. And um, I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I'll just jump. Y'all can go look, look Sardis up yourself. But what he says to Sardis is, he said, I wish you would wake up and strengthen the things that remain before they die. In other, in other words, Sardis was carrying some things that were of God, but they had gotten so frail and so weak because they had chosen to stay asleep. And in the history, actually, the city had been conquered at least twice because nobody had the forethought, I guess, to put anybody on the wall to be a watchman. And he said, I, Jesus is saying this to his church, I believe today. I wish you would wake up and strengthen the things that remain. <laughs> he said to the church in Philadelphia, he said, I know you. I know you just got a little bit of power, a little bit of strength. But bless God if you'll use what little bit you got, if you will. Strength is a really big deal. He told the church at Sardis, he said, I want you to remember how freely you received things from me. You didn't have to work for them. I just gave them to you. I just give them to you. But I want you to heed the warning that if you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief in the night at an unexpected time. And then look at, it, look at Jesus. Right there in that same place, he said, let me tell you something. Some of you still, y'all got your garments. That's good, right? She's been girding herself up with garments, strength. He said, I see you still have your garments. And he said, I, I can name a few names of those among you that have not soiled their garments. Now, I, I kind of always thought soiled your garments meant like, oh, you got some dirt on your dress. <laughs> but let's, let's say it like Jesus was probably saying it. He was probably saying when somebody soils themselves. He said, a few of you have not soiled yourselves. He said, and those will walk with me, and they will be wearing pure white. And for anybody who overcomes, there's the promise that that one will be dressed in white garments, and I will in no shape, way, or form erase their names from the book of life. And I will stand in front of my father and I will confess that one's name before my father and before his angels. And Jesus' instruction for that whole message to Sardis is, wake up and start to strengthen the things that you have. We, we're going to be that church, right? Yes. This end time church is going to be a woke church for real, not like they talking about out there. We're going to be awake for real, and we'll be strong. We're going to be strong. <clears throat> One other fascinating passage puts this, met this thought of girding yourself, rapping, and strengthening yourself, just like it is in Proverbs 31, is in 2 Samuel 6, 14. And when you use the word to understand the word, this is what I love. I could, 
I could just, oh, so good. Just, oh, don't you just get in the Word sometimes? You're just like, oh, this is over here too. And this is over here. Oh, did I knock it? Oh, uh, thank you. I can tell you about to keep going. I'm girding, I'm girding. <laughs> so, you know, when you see a piece, like, just like this, just I'm like, I, Lord, I don't understand what it means to gird myself with strength. What does that mean? I don't know how to do that. And he said, okay. Open it up. Crack the book. And listen to what I'm telling you. Right? See, because when you... Use the word to understand the word, you get the picture starts to come together. And in the power of the word, it brings its own power to create. And so the word itself becomes a prophecy that can speak to me and create even when my mind does not understand anything he's telling me, which is a lot. But the word of God can create on the inside of me and transform me so that what's on the inside of me that I carry now begins to shape and form the environment around me. We have to be people of the word. There's, there's not another way to do that. We have to be a people of the word. And there's no guilt and condemnation, you know, but just there's always hope that the word is going to transform. The Holy Ghost uses the word to build cities on the inside of me, to explore territory, to take mount. There's whole territories in me that had nobody has ever put their foot yet. And Jesus is at the base of the mountain saying, are you ready? You ready to go? You ready to go? I need you to open the word. Open the word. All right, let's go. I need, I need to be girded and ready for action to roll with him. And so, um, you know, honestly, this, I think there's something big hidden in Proverbs 31 that I hope maybe that I can <clears throat> break open this morning to, to show us how to put on strength and how to make our arms strong. If one of the accuser's best weapons it says in the book of Daniel that what he'll try to do to the saints in the, in the end days is wear them the slap out. And that is not, a, it's not even a physical word in the, in the um, Old Testament. That word means wear your mind down. Just keep running over it and running over it and running over it until you just war slam out, to say it E-N-C way. Worn slam out. And so, you know, the, the beautiful thing is this is what will keep us from getting worn out. I, no doubt in my mind, if you feel wore out, you're here for a reason, because <laughs> I know the remedy. The Lord has shown me the remedy. What I sense the Holy Spirit is breathing on is a third component that I would not have really seen had we not been in the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that component is a clue to how to stay strong in the Lord and how to, when you're feeling that, Wayne, what to do and where to go and how to stay in it. And that other component, I think, is joy. 2 Samuel 6, 14, the passage tells the story of a hard lesson David learned that God's presence always rides on people, never on man-made structures, not on ministries, not on uh, 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 5013Cs. God's glory does not ride on things. It only rides on people. And we see that the reverence for God does not always look like we think it ought to. Because when Uzzah reached out to steady the ark and the, and the glory of God broke out, 
God said, the problem is Uzzah's irreverence. Now, I would think that the most reverent person there was trying to steady the ark to keep it from falling off of that wagon. But God said that was not reverent. So I have to mm, shift my thinking to match the word. Lord, what are you saying? Because I want, I want to know. I want to know. Worship can be wild looking and weird and still be right in order with the Spirit of God. Now, that doesn't mean if it is weird and wild looking, then it's God, because I've seen a lot of that too. Right? Fuchsia Pickett said in the last days, the river of God was going to rise so deep and so swift. And she said, every believer will have the choice whether to wade on in or stand at the bank and talk about the trash that comes up in every flood. We all get a choice. We'll have to know. And we'll have to judge by the Spirit of God is the only one that can tell us what's real, what's authentic. We're looking for the authentic. So when David failed to bring up the ark of God's presence into Jerusalem the first time, he went back and here's this. Here's an interesting thing. He said, maybe we should open the instruction book and look and see what God said to do. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> so he said, let's have a second go at this thing. And there were vocalists and they were loud. And there were all kinds of stringed instruments and cymbals crashing. Everybody was shouting and trumpets were blasting. And the word says they were raising sounds of joy, and it was loud, and every 15 feet, I'm not really good at distance, but let's just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, stop, make a sacrifice, a bull and a fatling, not, 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 not a little bird, I'm talking about a whole bull right there. Every 15 feet, every 15 feet for eight miles. <sighs> Did I mention it was loud? In the second attempt, it says David was dancing before the Lord. With all his strength. And he was girded with a linen ephod. And y'all know the story. David was leaping and dancing and making merry before the Lord. And that's literally the way the word describes it. And Michael, Saul's daughter, David's wife, was somehow not down part of the thing that was going on in the street. She's somehow up in an ivory tower looking down out of her window. Don't know how that happened. That should let you know right away she was not in the river of joy. But she was standing on the banks running her mouth to herself. And it says, she looked out of that window and saw David and despised him in her heart. And she said, when she came down later out of her tower, well, my, how the king has distinguished himself today as one of the foolish ones with no shame. And David said, and I quote him here, wow. <laughs> wow. He said, God took your daddy <laughs> and his whole house out of the kingly line. And he put me in, in his place. And if you think I looked undignified today, 
you need to hang around. Because I can be more undignified than this. Because I will celebrate for the Lord is my strength. No, 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 no. He said, today I was clothed in strength. He said, there may have been blood and guts for eight miles, but I was dancing in the river. There was a river that day that was flowing from the throne. And as David's life has done for us frequently, his actions set us a precedent. We should learn from David. He was setting us a precedent that the joy of the Lord is our strength. That kings have to worship in joy. Because our King Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy above his brethren. All his companions. Jesus was anointed with joy. And it's a secret to operating in the strength of the Lord to stay in joy. The epitaph from the word, Michael said, Michael, it says about Michael that she was barren until the day of her death. Just like, it's like, raise up her tombstone right there at that event because she never repented and write on it, never had anything but barrenness the rest of her life. And I'll cue this, judgmental without joy brings barrenness. And we all make judgments. I mean, no, no kidding. I mean, glory to God, the things I'm doing now, if I'd seen myself 20 years doing it, uh, 20 years ago doing it, I would say, girl, you have lost your mind. That is not right. But I stay open as much as I can, Lord, teach me. Teach me, Lord. Teach me. My God, this is too important to blow this. This is too important. One other story about joy and strength. This is Nehemiah 8. Y'all know the story. The walls around Jerusalem have been rebuilt, and all the people gather in Jerusalem as one man. We're in a one-man season right now. It's the Feast of Trumps, and Ezra stands up to read from the scroll, and the people stand, and Ezra keeps on reading for six hours. And instead of them leaving quietly to go to Burger King, <laughs> they start to cry. They begin to weep. Because the more he reads, the more they realize how far they have fallen from God's pattern. And they are cut to the quick. And now this is going on um, at the Feast of Trumps. This is one of the highest, most holy, serious, and sober events that they're getting ready to enter into for the Day of Atonement where you really get pretty serious and sober about things. And there's confession and contrition, and they begin to weep. But then Ezra and Nehemiah stand up, and they say to the people, they say, this day is holy to God. Do, don't you dare keep on crying. Don't you dare weep. But you go eat of the fat. I'm sure it was barbecue, don't you think? Drink of the sweet and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. Do not be grieved because today I want you to understand that the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, however much joy the Lord has, if you are walking in the revelation of the joy of the Lord, you are going to have strength. That's what feeds your strength. That's the fountain of strength, the fountain of God's joy supplies me with strength. 
and the people went on their way and it said they made a great rejoicing. And then just to like put cherry on the cake, they opened the book again and they said, oh, what? We get another party? It's Feast of Tabernacles? And we're commanded to have a party and celebrate? Yes, our God is cool. Right? I've heard Bill Johnson say that this passage shows us that there is a biblical reason for joy. And I want you to get this. He says, my personal strength is only equal to my joy. My personal strength is only equal to my joy. Let me say it again. As we head into the last day of Sukkot, when God's people are commanded to celebrate, my personal strength is only equal to and limited by the joy of the Lord that I'm experiencing. I'll become even more undignified than this, right? I've been sitting out in a tent in my backyard all week. I take every meal I can out there, wasting time in the joy of the Lord. I highly recommend it. I get to choose to celebrate. And I learned from that Isaiah 54 woman, that shout for joy barren woman, that woman that says, hey, What did you say, God? Build the nursery before I'm even pregnant? I've had year after year after year after year of barrenness. There's nothing to make me think I could have a baby now. And God comes and he says, oh, you know all that barrenness? See what happened is you forgot that your creator is your husband. And what is that to God Almighty? What's a little place of barrenness? Don't wait to celebrate till you get your mess straight. Come on, right? Don't wait to celebrate to get till you get your mess straight. You won't never celebrate if you if you wait. Right? Party. Go ahead, party. Party with Jesus. I, uh, during COVID, uh, I was listening to this prophet and she accidentally blended two words that I was like, dude, that's prophetic. She apologized. I don't think she heard it. She, she was trying to say the word how, she was trying to say that when you celebrate, you go into a season of acceleration. Like it puts you on, you know, that people mover at the airport. Like you can walk if you want to. Or you can walk on the people mover and you're going really fast, right? She said, celebration. And I was like, mm, that'll preach. Joy moves you to a new place like nothing else can. Now, I'm not talking about this stuff that you like work on, uh, uh, work, I'm working it up, working it up. No, I'm just saying that there are times you have to fit. In the kingdom, you don't wait. You just don't wait. Sometimes you, I've had people in, on Sunday come up to me and say, wow, you must be really happy. You're dancing today. And I was like, no, you do not understand. Today, I made my body Get in line and celebrate. I'm not feeling it. I'm not even thinking it. But we're going, oh, it's going, it's going to be, my, I'm going to be the master over this body. Today, you're going to celebrate, darling. You don't get it. So sometimes you have to engage physically somehow to break through into joy. Laugh. Take the biggest area of barrenness in your life and put it in your hand, Bill Johnson says. Just hold it right there. You know, everybody's got one. 
It's the biggest area of barrenness where you're not seeing the Lord move. You're just like, God, is that ever gonna change? <laughs> and start laughing at it. Just laugh at it. Shout with joy, because you don't know what I know. You don't know what I know. Oh, God, he's going to break it. God will break it. God will break it. Amen. Amen. The pure expression of joy, Bill says, is the most reasonable solution for any barrenness that I'm facing. And Lord, if that's not enough, if you look at verse 25 of Proverbs 31, you'll see that this woman's clothing are described as strength and majestic beauty, and she laughs at the latter days. <laughs> what would happen if you just literally took that thing that's just been gnawing, 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 and you started laughing at it instead? You would look crazy. You do look crazy, but we are crazy people. We don't do things like the world does. The world says, worry about it. Worry about it. Oh, talk about it. Worry about it. Just talk about it. Talk about it to everybody. Or don't talk about it at all. Hold it in. And the Lord says, laugh at it. Laugh at it. You know, in Isaiah 54, it says, Oppression will be far from you because you refuse to fear. Now, see, our minds will hear that and we'll say, oh, 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 I won't be afraid because I'm not oppressed. That's not what it says. It says, because you do not fear, which is the door of the enemy, to get his foot in, because you refuse to open that door to the enemy, you won't be oppressed. Mm. Ooh. 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 Just as last year I read again, she laughs at her future, at her latter days. These prophetic words have brought me a greater level of alignment with his word. It was a correction. And it happened when I just started muttering this word. I started meditating on this word. Lord, Proverbs 31, woman, she laughs at her future. She's not hearing voices tell her how bad it's going to get. All the things I'm not going to have. The things I've had that I might lose. Think about what happens to us as we age. We get, our world many times gets smaller. And we get more fearful and tighter. And this woman knows how to laugh at her future. Hmm. Come on, that's somebody's word. The devil says, I don't think anyone much has uh, thought that the last few years was a laughing matter, Angie. <laughs> we can do some damage to the enemy by laughing in his face face. Hmm. And that, not because I got my own strength to back me up. I have the joy of the Lord that is my strength. I think I've operated too long under a misunderstanding of Peter's words to be sober-minded, it says in 1 Peter 1.13. He says, be, gird up your hearts and your minds for actions and be sober-minded. And somehow in our Western way of thinking, that starts looking like you got bathed in pickle juice instead of baptized in living water. It's just not a laughing matter. You shouldn't be having that much fun at church. I'm feeling a little out of control in here. Things are a little out of control. There's, like a, little, there's a lot going on. Oh. People say, oh, I'm just not that emotional. Oh, maybe you need to be. <laughs> God created you in three dimensions, and one of those has the ability to feel. We don't all have to do the same thing, but we should 
be able to feel and experience a God whose primary heart of love wants us as his children to experience him. So, if you back up in that first Peter 1, you'll see that Peter says this is... Uh, what we do. We greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. The passion says, Peter says, we are saturated with ecstatic joy, full of glory, immersed in glory. I'm telling y'all, we can't afford to wait to celebrate before we get our mess straight. I love pictures. Pictures paint fullness to help me remember spiritual truths and access them quickly. So if I want a picture of what joy looks like so I can move in it more quickly than going, now think about this and think about this and think about this. Joy, I need that picture. What does joy look like? Because joy feeds my strength. And so when I'm feeling, Lord, I just feel like I'm getting worn out. I need to have a picture so I can engage quickly, right? I looked at scripture for this picture, and I found one in Psalm 46. It says that there, now you'll know how to get into his joy. This is a battle song of Zion, song of holy confidence. Now, you know, if this whole song is about confidence in God, he's saying there, there will always be a challenge to your confidence in me. That's what the Lord is saying. But he says also, you have a secret to confidence in God, and it's in verse 4. You got your word, you look it up, but I'll read a piece of it out of the Nas. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God's in the midst of her, and she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. I I love how the King James says it, because it says, God shall help her, and that right early. I love that. The psalmist tells us that vindication of our confidence in God is coming And also tells us what to do until that vindication is made manifest. He said, go to the river that brings the joy. That makes happy the hearts. And he says, get in the river. Cease striving. Be still. Let go. Relax and know that I am God because I am your strength and I am your stronghold. I am your O's. You won't find strength anywhere else. Best thing for you to do is get your trunks on and go to the river. There's a river of joy and the water of life is flowing from the throne. And Jesus said, if you'll just keep coming to me and keep drinking from me, rivers will start busting out of your belly. Psalm 36 tells us that we can drink our fill from the river of God's delights. So he said, look for the river, get in the river, drink the river, stay in the river as long as you can Because the river is the life of God. It didn't just flow from the throne. It's flowing from God himself who is on the throne. It's a river of God. It's his life. There is a river of joy. One of the prophetic words for this year is that we will, as as the church of Jesus, we will have to war for the water. Now, when I first heard the prophets start saying that, I was like, what does that mean? Do I need to go out and buy one of them straws where you can suck that dirty water in and it's clean? You know what I'm talking about? 
I was like, what you talking about? War for the water. Somebody getting ready to mess up our water. What is going on, God? Do I need to dig another well? What are you talking about? I don't know about all that, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm pretty sure about this. <laughs> if you think you won't have to do some contending to get in this river and let go and relax and good luck with that. Tell me how that works out for you. Because I'm having to war to get in the river so that I can let go and go with God. And Jesus said, keep coming to me, keep drinking of me, keep believing in me, and the river will keep moving out of me. Many years, Dutch, I'm going to call the praise team up. Many years, Dutch Sheets had an open vision about being in the river of God. I mean, like, this has been many years ago. He wrote a book about it, and he called it The River of God, and he talked about revival. He, it was a picture of revival to him. The Lord willing and the creek don't rise, I'm going to make a video this week and release it. I'll release it. And all I'm going to do is just read that first chapter. If you got that book, go read it. But if you don't have it, I'm going to I'm gonna try to read it and release it. It's so powerful. I've read it many times through the years, but it's never hit me like it hit me today. Dutch reminds us that to be in the river is to be in God. To drink from the river is to drink from God. And to release the, re the river is to release God. In other, in other words, the river is not just some experience that people have. It is the life of God himself. So when I talk about the joy that comes from being in the river, I'm talking about being aware that I'm in the presence of the king. I'm moving with him. I don't understand that. And I'm so glad I don't have to understand it in order to contend for something I can't even comprehend. The river of God is here to cleanse us. I know this from the word. It's here to deliver us. You can drink the river. You can even breathe in the river. The river is for rest and refreshing. The river is full of joy and life. It is a paradox. It both quenches my thirst and creates it. God's river of joy is infectious. You get a good drink off of that river, go out in public, see what happens. It's healing. It's traveling, and everywhere it goes, life flows out of that river. God wants us to experience him. So if you close your eyes right now, I'm just going to pray and release that as a prophetic word over this house. Father, I thank you. We have, I thank you for your strength, the strength of God to do everything that you've called us to do. And to do it in joy so that we can turn and laugh even at our future. We laugh at it. And Lord, we thank you for um, girding us up with your strength as we step into the river, Lord. I thank you for the Ezekiel River now that's flowing, that begins at the ankle and moves up to the knee and then up to the hip. And then eventually waters so deep Water's so deep. Water's so deep. I can't even ford the river. And so God, I release that river. I release the river of your life into this house and over your people. Lord, I know this wouldn't even be possible without the blood and the body of Jesus. And so we thank you, Lord. Even today, I get, we, get to, we get to sit down and just in a small way, experience what that's like when we hear the knock and open the door to the master. We are dressed and ready. And he said, oh, baby, I want you to sit down now and let me feed you at my table. So, Lord, I thank you that everything we have comes from Jesus. Everything that we have comes from God. 
All our fountains are in you, Lord. Everything that we need, everything that we need, we already have in you. And so, Father, we thank you for the revelation of this season and what you're doing with the body. And, and God, we, we give you honor and glory. We just prophesy to the waters that they are rising. <laughs> oh, Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Kept hearing this little song I've been singing with about the river rising. And there's a line in there that says, You haven't seen the real me until you've seen me in joy. And I started prophesying that over y'all this morning. If you could get your head down in this river and shake, 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 you see the Lord's washing a lot of things off of his body right now. And nobody's really seen us yet until they've seen us in the joy of the life of God that we find in the river. I love y'all. When you're done, um, you feel free to take communion because there's life in it. And then um, if you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, do not leave this house without, do not leave today. Don't leave today if there's any question if, the, if he's your Savior or not. Um, uh, until you talk to somebody. Danny's here, I'm here. If you need prayer, go in the prayer room. But I love y'all. Amen. Amen.